Good afternoon and good evening to you all. Thanks for joining today's webinar uh, entitled Power Forward, uh, a look at rehabilitation and function with powered processes. I'm Kurt Grubin. I'm a CPO with uh, the OSER Global Academy as a senior clinical specialist, and I'll be today's uh, host for the webinar. But we certainly have a few other people on this team that make this whole webinar possible. Uh, let me first uh, introduce you to a couple of people who are helping us behind the scenes. First, I'd like to draw attention to Marika uh, Van Roy, who is sitting in the Netherlands. And uh, she reminds me that that she her title here is Queen of the World because she controls everything that goes on in the background of this webinar, and she can control who's being seen and who's being heard. Uh, and so thank you, Marika, for your help and your tireless effort in behind the scenes. Uh, we appreciate it very much. I'd like to also introduce you to Jan Christensen. He is our uh, Academy Director for our Emerging Markets in OSER. He is located in Denmark, and he will be helping out with the questions and answers that we will do. We'll have some discussion at various times throughout today's presentation, and we'll have an opportunity to interface with, with Dr. Gailey, uh, with our special guest, Paul Hurley, and I may answer a few questions as well. I'll briefly introduce our, introduce our special guest, uh, that is Paul Hurley. Paul uh, comes to us from Virginia in the United States, not too far from Washington, D.C. He wears a prosthesis as of about 15 years now, and we'll be sharing some of his experiences with us in his time on the current Parney, but also some of his experiences in uh, his use of other prostheses as well. So we'll know, get to know Paul just a little bit more uh, in uh, a little bit later in today's presentation, but thank you, Paul, for being with us here today. We very much appreciate it. I also will introduce you to today, today's host or today's uh, featured speaker, which is Dr. Gailey, and I'll formally introduce him to you in just a little bit. But uh, what I'd like to do first is just show you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Firstly, what we'll do is you know, just a background of this whole webinar today is that we are in a, what I think might be a new era of prosthetics. Uh, in our experience as physical therapists and as prosthetists, we basically have been working with devices that control motion. Now, there's a few in upper extremity and there's an ankle unit that, that provides uh, motion uh, by itself in lower extremity prosthetics. But when it comes to knee technology, our experiences are primarily working with products that control motion. This has been the history we've had within prosthetics over the years. If you think about uh, the advent of carbon fiber feet in the 1980s, those helped to control the way that we rolled over a prosthetic foot and changed the industry from what we had used previously with single axis feet and satch feet. And then we came to around the year 2000 and microprocessor knees uh, came on board and with the with the sea leg, uh, it changed the way that we controlled motion in a knee joint. And this changed the industry. It became a standard of care to use microprocessor knee control. We believe at OSER that there's an opportunity here to advance one step even beyond. In lower extremity prosthetics, adding power will change things. And we're excited to have you join us in our discussion today. And I will share a little bit about what Powerney is and how it works. And then Bob will, will help us out in understanding more about how we can provide rehabilitation around this product with powered knee technology. We'll talk about getting up and going, about being safe and learning how to take small steps and controlled steps, and then also how to get out in the community with power. And then we'll finish up, we'll have a few opportunities to have discussion, with Dr. Gailey and with Paul Hurley and a little bit with myself, and then we'll close up today with some final thoughts. But first, I'd like to just give you a little bit of insight into power knee technology. Uh, Oser's belief is that, uh, is that active power in a prosthesis can add transformative, transformative value to a prosthesis. Uh, we believe that it, we've already seen this in our limited release of the power knee so far and in our history of power knee, 
And what we're seeing is that we think it has the opportunity to change what people expect from their prosthesis. So as we look at uh, what power knee has been over the years, I'll, I'll take a look at some history here. Oser's belief in adding power to a microprocessor knee joint has been around for 15 years. Uh, we started with the power knee one and, and yes, it's large and yes, it had some mass to it. Uh, and we refined that technology to make it more user-friendly and more applicable to a broader uh, scope of users. And we've continued to, uh, to move in that same direction. And I think we've ta taken a large leap forward in what we can provide now with the current power knee, which will be released in quarter one of next year. A few key things to keep in mind is that its intuitive nature is one of the biggest things that has changed. Reading how the user moves and adopting and adapting to that input is what power knee is all about. The way power knee operates, and this will be quick, I promise you, but uh, it, it uses sensor technology, has the microprocessor control, of course, and a motor, that sensor technology uh, reads different things. It reads where the knee is in space. It knows where the thigh and the shin are in space at all times. It also knows how much and when the user is putting a flexion moment into the knee or an extension moment into the knee. So the user on the prosthesis has a bit of control of deciding when to, for instance, initiate ramp descent or when to avoid initiating ramp descent. Uh, and, and then also the knee always knows how much weight is on it. So those inputs that get fed into the system that compares that with normal human locomotion, normal ADLs, and makes the right decision at the right time. And this one is one of the big advances that Powerty has made over this next generation that is coming to us all in the beginning of next year. And then finally, if you're not already aware, Powered technology involves a motor. Inside the knee, at the top of that knee is where the motor is housed. And that motor provides us with a lot of extra benefits. Things like a lock, things like assistance during all kinds of activities. So with that, what I'd like to do is um, hand the reins over to Dr. Gailey. Dr. Gailey is gonna take us through talking about how rehabilitation can be shaped and formed around this type of technology and how this technology reshapes and maybe reforms uh, the way we provide some rehabilitation. Uh, Dr. Gailey, as many of you are familiar with who he is, uh, but we should, we should let everyone know that uh, Dr. Gailey comes to us with a wealth of, wealth of knowledge, both in prosthetics and in physical therapy. He is, is a, a professor at the University of Miami. He's been there for 30 plus years. He has his, his PhD in, in prosthetics from Strathclyde University in Glasgow, Scotland. And as many of you know, he's well published in the area of biomechanics and prosthetics combined together. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Gailey, uh, welcome to today. And we look forward to hearing your messaging around power and rehabilitation. Kurt, thanks so much and uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, kind of a neat way to wrap up uh, a tenuous year and we have so much to look forward to next year, uh, including uh, new technologies and prosthetics. So it's, it's terrific to have the opportunity to chat about that just a bit. And again, as always, I want to thank Marika and Jan for being in the background and making all this happen and looking forward to chatting with Paul in just a few minutes. But if we were to talk about rehab, um, if we look at ideal theoretical rehab in teaching somebody how to use a prosthesis, I kind of formulate the idea that we could divide it into thirds. Um, and I know it varies and it's very complex, but in the broadest sense, we could look at about one third of rehab uh, and is preparing somebody for the prosthesis and strengthening them once they receive the prosthesis and to help them to maintain balance. Then we generally spend one third of our time, ideally teaching them about the features of the prosthesis, how to make the knee bend, how to stand, uh, and how to engage the, the, the knee or the foot in different types of situations. And then finally, 
we have about a third of our training should be on the functional aspects, how to get out of a chair, how to get into a chair, how to uh, be able to walk in different environments and how to use stairs and ramps. Unfortunately, that rarely happens. Um, what we find is we spend uh, probably about 40% of our time with these mythical uh, percentages of preparing somebody with uh, working on their strength and balance. And then in my experience, another 40% is teaching them how a knee and a prosthetic foot will work. And then all of a sudden we're coming to the end of rehabilitation and we have to teach them all about the environment, ramps and stairs and curbs and how to use the prostheses in different situations. And that kind of gets just shoved right into the end of rehabilitation. And so the idea was maybe if there was a way that we could decrease the need for conscious muscular effort. In other words, the prosthetic wearer knows the prosthesis is going to be there for them. Could we decrease that time that was spent with strengthening and balance because they had the confidence and they know that they could use their muscles and it just felt a little more natural. Then the next is, can we decrease the amount of time it takes for somebody to learn how to use the prostheses? Could the prostheses maybe be a little bit more intuitive? And therefore, we can in theoretically increase our time for uh, learning all the functional skills. And in my long career, I don't think I've seen something come to uh, our profession, such as the powered knee, that allows us to do this. In fact, again, with this mythical type of uh, environment, what I see with the prosthetic knee, is the, the power knee, is we can increase that functional training time to half of that prosthetic training time because the knee is going to allow us to decrease the time that we have to spend with strengthening and balance and prosthetic training. Because what we are hearing from folks is if you have that baseline, then the knee is going to give you greater stability. By having that greater stability in the knee, because you know it's not going to uh, um, collapse on you, you know it's going to be there for you, whether you're on flat level ground or whether you're on different terrains, uh, whether you're on the stairs or the ramps, um, it will increase your confidence. If it increases a person's confidence, then they're going to get up and they're going to be more mobile quicker. The neat thing is it also reduces that cognitive focus. In other words, the person no longer has to think of, okay, if I roll over the toe and I move my hip, I engage the knee. If I hyperextend at the end, it's going to relax the flow of the fluid so that my knee will then uh, move in a different manner. It becomes intuitive. And if it becomes intuitive, then the person is able to adapt to the task at hand because the knee is going to adapt to the task at hand. So we call it IPA. And we're not talking about the beverage that a person would like to enjoy after they complete their rehab. We're talking about intuitive, powered, accelerated rehab. And the idea is that if the knee is intuitive, because of the power features that are within the knee, then the person can enjoy an accelerated rehab time and move through the basics, such as strengthening and balance and learning about the prostheses and get more into the functional training. And one person said, you know what? <clears throat> you don't have to go through all the details. Just remind me what I need to do. In other words, remind me what I used to do. I'm going to do it and the knee is going to follow along. And that was always the goal with prosthetics. Can we do have a device that mimics the human limb? And I think that we are not all the way there, but we're so close. So I'm going to ask Kurt to talk a little bit about some of the function cap uh, uh, capabilities of the knee in sitting and standing, and then I'll talk about the rehab. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, it's what you'll see here in front of you is a, a, a list or some icons of the various functions of power knee, and we'll see, we'll get through this entire list through today's uh, today's webinar. But we'll start out firstly with the two most, probably two of the most important things. We need to get up and going before we can get going. Uh, so sitting and standing, what the power knee is doing here with this motor power. In sitting down, it's providing control and resistance on the way down from sitting from a standing position into a seat 
uh, and it's going to provide that resistance all the way down into that sitting position. Now, if somebody wants to sit fast, they can bypass the knee and just use their sound side. But our goal is to try and give somebody the opportunity to be more symmetrical in their sitting down and their standing up. So in standing up, the power knee uses the motor to provide ex uh, extension assistance. And so it has torque on it that can lift the patient up out of the chair. You'll see that in the videos coming forward. So sitting down control and lift assist is what we're gonna talk about here first. Thanks, Kurt. So first we want the pretest. So if we ask somebody to just stand up, we wanna observe how are they standing up? And what we see in this case with Paul, he's shifting his buttocks over the intact limb. And so you can see his therapist there, Allison Simsack, who has um, generously given us time to help us with the demonstrations, kind of give him a look like, yeah, Paul, that wasn't so good. So we see again, and she notices, oh my goodness, he did the old, I'm going to pull the intact limb back so that maybe it looks like I'm sharing the weight, but I'm really using just my intact limb. And then when he goes to sit, notice the feet are together, looking good but allison notices oh he pulled it back and now his buttocks slid to the side so he's only using that sound limb he's negating the features that are in the knee so what we see is this is that the weight is towards the intact limb his buttock shifts towards the intact limb which means he's using the intact limb and just to verify it allison has a little trick what she does is she'll ask him to stand. And when she does, oh, a little bit of pressure and poof, there he goes over to the side. And so the what he's seeing is that the he's really just standing on his sound limb. The issue with that is if you get in and out of a chair 50 to 55 times a day and you're just relying on that sound limb, it's like anything is going to wear out over time. So the goal becomes, how can we get the person to better use both limbs and not just rely on the sound limb? Because that's going to improve his balance overall. So what she does is she applies a little bit of pressure or gives graded resistance through the hip into the knee. And as he does so, he brings the buttocks back over the prosthetic limb. And as he does that, it gets more weight into the prosthesis. Now, to help to facilitate that, he'll put his hands on his knees just to push down. It's a little appropriate set of input to remind him to keep the weight down through the limb. As a result, we'll also ask him to focus on shifting his buttocks towards the prosthetic limb and get his weight over the toes when he gets out of the chair and back on his heels when he sits in the chair. That is no different than how you and I might get in and out of a chair. Probably the only difference is we have to remind him to use his hip extensors or to push down and back in his prosthesis as he stands. A few times doing that and with the power uh, exist that comes out of the power knee is going to make it easier for him to use both limbs and therefore reduce the stress and strain on the sound limb. After a little bit of training, you see he pops right up and out of the chair. And then when he goes to sit down, he brings the feet back. He puts the weight down through the heels and uses the arm rest like anyone would when getting out of the chair. Now, some may say, well, is he really using all of his prosthetic limb to get out of a chair? So let's look on the right side of the screen. As he gets out of the chair, he's pretty much just using his powered prosthesis to get out of the chair. How do we know? He goes back and looks, and that is a paper cup right there, which he stood over his foot or was underneath his foot. And if he were to have used his intact limb, he would have crushed that paper cup, but he was able to stand up independently on the prosthetic limb and without crushing the cup. So that was just standing on that powered limb. So what's the end result? Stands up, walks out of the frame, goes around the block, comes back, sits down, and he does it all in a smooth and comfortable manner. So that's getting the person up and out of the chair, ready to learn how to walk. And so there's a few features with the power knee we would like you to know about walking. Kurt? 
Thank you, Bob. Uh, so during walking, one of the things that's not inherently obvious when you watch somebody walking on power knee is that it provides powered flexion and powered extension. Uh, and so it's something to keep in mind is, is as opposed to passive knees that have their motion created by the dynamics of gait and the movement of the, of the socket and the movement of the hips, in addition to that, that the user provides, the power knee actually provides a powered lift to reach maximum heel rise. And then in the end of swing phase, it provides powered extension to get out to near full extension. Uh, so that's one of the huge benefits we see. What people tell us is that they feel that they are able to walk distances a little bit longer. We actually have a study that looked at that there's a reduction in metabolic cost relative to passive microprocessor knees that the power knee provides. So we're excited about that. We have some proof saying that this does really help. When someone lands on their prosthesis in early stance and throughout all stance, the, the power knee uses the motor to lock and hold that position. But when somebody lands on the prosthesis, there's a slight movement of the knee that is part of the inherent design of the knee. And you'll see that shown in one of the slides later here. I'll explain more about that as we go forward. Finally, uh, you'll notice in the picture on the left that the look of the power knee is quite different than the previous version. Previous version had an aluminum casing to it. And now this is made with a carbon fiber uh, in basically kind of carbon fiber infused uh, polymer. And so it's much lighter than, and than the previous version. And of course, that's always a win. So Paul, or excuse me, Paul is going to show you the walking. Bob is going to talk about how we can train during walking. Great. Thanks, Kurt. So again, we want to do the pre-evaluation. And here is the typical gait of somebody who has not received proper gait training. They kind of lift and they kick the prostheses forward. So when somebody does this, the weight moves towards the intact limb again, putting greater stress on the sound limb. The buttocks is obviously going to shift to the attack limb. If you look from the person from behind, you'll see the cleft of the buttocks kind of facing the intact limb. Um, the intact limb is going to externally rotate, putting stress on the knee, the prosthetic limbs got to get out of the way and abduct. And you put all this together and now the person's going to have difficulty balancing. And the only way they can advance the limb is lifting and kicking it. And you'll see the absence of arm swing because they're basically trying to balance as they walk on the tightrope. And the thing that is in neat about the power knee is when we go to teach somebody how to use the limb, we're able to um, teach them in a more intuitive manner. But what we first have to do is just get the normal body mechanics. Now, what are the keys with the body mechanics? Is that restoration of pelvic transverse rotation. So when he lifts and kicks the limb, his center of mass is moving forward. How do we know this? Allison just puts a little bit of pressure on his anterior superior iliac spine or the ASIS, and she can stop this big naval officer right there. Oh, I can't go anywhere. And you can see she's enjoying every minute of it because there's no way she should be able to stop a service member like Paul with that much ease, but obviously she relishes in the opportunity to do so. As a result of having the loss of balance because of no, not having transverse rotation in the pelvis, you're going to see the, in, uh, the asymmetrical step length. That can be one, the pelvic rotation, two, the inability to balance over the prosthetic limb. You also see the buttocks moving to midline. You're not going to see as much knee flexion and um, he'll have the loss of swing. So the pole doesn't have to suffer to watch this any longer, let's fix it. So all we simply ask Allison to do is to restore normal motion. The knee will take care of the rest. In the past, we used to have to break down and get one motion, then another motion, then a third. But what we find is that if we can just restore pelvic rotation by resistive gait training, like what she's doing, getting that very small motion, five degrees forward on either side of the pelvis, the knee takes care of the rest. And so she's just guiding him and again, reminding him what he needs to do or what he did before he wore a prosthesis when he walked. 
Now, the most difficult thing is once you get that pelvic rotation is taking short steps. So she's teaching him how to initiate with the uh, sound limb. And by the way, you can start with either limb. You don't need to start with either the sound limb or the prosthetic limb, just start walking and it will follow. Um, and as she does it, the hard thing is to get those nice, short, precise steps because it's more difficult, you have to balance. And after the first two or three steps, as with any prosthesis, he's now starting to get the feel of what he needs to do. He can also take very long steps when he needs to. Now that's also very difficult with most prostheses, but as you can see, in this case, he can take these big leaping steps and the knee will follow whatever the body tells it it needs to do. So then you put everything together and you get nice controlled steps. And after the first couple of steps, he's getting a nice flow with both the intact and the prosthetic limb. And you can see he just kind of takes nice, quiet, easy steps, rolling over both limbs. The arm swing naturally comes back. And now he's walking under a controlled uh, situation. He's just walking. He's not having to focus on what the knee needs to do. He's just going from point A to point B. So once you put it all together, he then gets the flow after a little bit of time. And then you can see he's got a nice natural gait. And again, the key is one, he has a beautiful gait, but it's the reduced amount of time that it took to get him to this point to be able to have nice symmetrical steps, nice and smooth. You notice he's kind of looking away, wondering what needs to do and to let the arm swing and you get that nice smooth gait. Now, one of the things that we talked about is the confidence in the knee. And we're not asking people to do this, but if you notice as he stands on that flexed knee, the knee is there to hold him. Remember we spoke about, spoke about if you work on strength and balance and you gain confidence in the knee because it gives you stability, you can decrease that amount of time for muscular training within the socket. And as you can see, the uh, power knee is going to give him that confidence because it's pretty darn stable. Now, you may think that that's a frozen picture, but it's not. And he rolls onto the knee and it holds him there. So if he has this kind of confidence to go into this position, then walking, especially if he's on a, a small incline or different terrain, is not going to be of concern. Therefore, he can use his muscles and he doesn't have to focus on the knee. He just focuses on the function. And again, let me underscore, we don't ask people to stand on their toes with their knees flexed. This is just merely illustrating what would take place. But I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Kurt and let's talk to Paul a bit. Thank you, Bob, I uh, appreciate that. And uh, we'll bring uh, Paul up on the screen here in just a little bit. I'd like to introduce you to you formally our, our, our product champion uh, wearing the power knee and being the star of all of these videos that we're gonna to see today. Uh, Mr. Paul Hurley. Uh, Paul comes to us, as I mentioned before, uh, from Virginia and is close to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, he is a background investigator. He can tell you more about what that means and uh, is married and has a, a couple of young children. Um, Paul has, has been on a prosthesis, wearing a prosthesis for uh, nearly 15 years, and uh, he'll share with us a little bit about his experiences that in that way. He is a retired petty officer from the US Navy. And uh, Paul will bring you up. And if you don't mind, I would love for you to give just a little bit about your story and your experiences with various prostheses that you have used over the years. Sure. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, my name is Paul Hurley. Uh, as Kurt said, I live uh, about 40 minutes outside of the Washington DC area. Uh, I get a lot of my care at uh, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. I was injured when I was 20 years old overseas with the Navy and uh, became an amputee several weeks after that. It was uh, October 6, 2006 was when I was injured. And I um, uh, received my amputation in Germany in Launchstuhl. Uh, after that, uh, and it was the result basically of a uh, very traumatic injury and then an infection. Uh, eventually after that. So I uh, went back to the States, ended up at Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is now Walter Reed. And uh, I was bedridden for about three months. I received, um, uh, well, my initial fitting, I remember it was on Thanksgiving um, later. And then I didn't actually get out of the bed until 
a little while after that. So it was, um, yeah, it was relatively about three months. And when I did lots of nerve damage, uh, lots of pain, lots of discomfort, it took me about six months just to be able to comfortably, well, not even comfortably, but uncomfortably walk across the therapy room from point A to point B. It was very difficult. Um, I, I spent a lot of time on a tilt table, um, just basically trying to, it felt like fire when I put my leg over the edge of the bed. And I, um, I remember my physical therapist noting that I was having a lot more trouble with my sound side uh, than I was with my prosthetic side. So um, I initially started out on a sea leg. Uh, I tried the, the blue brick Rio, the original Rio. Um, I went from there to a number of different, uh, well, some experimental knees and uh, other um, more common, such as uh, uh, mechanical knees, like the total knee, um, ended up on that for a while. Um, but before all that, uh, I was, uh, I guess, a pretty good candidate uh, for one of the original power knee users. And uh, I remember it was about a three-day process where I wasn't even allowed to take it home initially with me. Uh, it was just three days of training prior to, and they gave me this huge backpack charger uh, for it. And, and it did, the battery life was not real great. It had a foot plate in the sound side. And it was, there was a lot of, um, uh, you had to, there was, a, there was a pretty big learning curve as far as um, knowing how to trigger it and to go into stair mode, different modes, things like that. Um, but I, I credit that knee for actually uh, getting me just out of my head for one and, and learning how to um, go further, push myself further, go further distances. That's the knee that I, um, I went to college with initially, um, George Mason University, uh, uh, when I, where I received my bachelor's degree. And uh, that, that whole campus is a very, it's a closed campus. So lots of walking, lots of stairs. Uh, if you're not familiar, you can Google it yourself. Um, uh, but after that, um, I, I felt like I had outgrown that knee at a certain point. I ended up um, walking around with a total knee for a very long time. Um, was uh, um, going, I, I went through a number of those. And uh, after that ended up uh, going back to microprocessor knees because um, over the years wear and tear really started feeling a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of that use on my sound side. So I really wanted to save, um, you know, preserve that integrity of my knee um, and just that whole left side in general. Um, I mean, when, um, when I was injured, I broke my femur on my sound side as well. Had uh, two four-inch nails in my hip, a rod in my femur, four nails in my knee. Uh, kneecap was wired together. Um, lot, lots of things going on there. So uh, eventually, um, uh, I ended up on this uh, newest power knee. And uh, I, I was also on the second iteration as well. Big, vast improvements here. Um, from Even from the second to the third, but especially from the first to the third here. Battery life. Um, I can get through a full day of walking. I, um, I, my, my son is in Cub Scouts. We do lots of hikes all the time. Um, he's, uh, and, and with this latest power knee, um, I, I'm not, it's, uh, a lot more user-friendly, a lot more natural to me. And, you know, especially when you're navigating through a pack of lions, um, meaning the Cub Scouts, kindergartners, um, it's, it's kind of like, uh, trying to walk around a pack of ferrets. It's, uh, there's a lot of, <laughs> you got to watch your footwork. A lot of times, a lot of it's it's easy to get knocked off balance, but um, that is one of the things that I like about this knee um, is that even the weight of it, uh, while some people might note when they pick it up, it's a little heavy. Um, that motor really makes up for a lot of that uh, that weight. And as long as you got a really comfortable fitting socket, not even really comfortable, but comfortable fitting socket, um, you're not going to notice that weight, um, and it, you're still going to be able to push yourself a little bit farther than you might um, with you know just a regular microprocessor knee and just that balance. Um, it's taking away a lot of that pain that I was feeling in my uh, lower back. Um, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm able to get assist standing up, uh, step over step over stairs. Um, I just feel a lot more balanced is really, um, that's the key takeaway for me. Uh, presently, I'm a, I'm a special investigator for the U.S. Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Um, so lots of walking um, with that from, from time to time, uh, whether I'm trying to track down a lead or um, you know, record checks, things like that. So, uh, but I think that it's pretty good synopsis, Kurt, back to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate uh, your comments and, and uh, thank you for uh, your service to our country as well. Uh, uh, we will start off our discussion session with a question for you. Uh, so we'll come right back to you here. Uh, one of the things you've kind of 
uh, identified this, but how long did it take you to learn how to walk with this power knee? So uh, with this one, it, there wasn't a um, very big learning curve at all. They uh, pretty much put it on me and I didn't know what to expect. I was kind of asking for the rundown, you know, the briefing, how, how it works. And they pretty much just said, walk like, walk like you used to um, without the knee um, when, you know, when you had two legs, it's like, okay. Um, and I, it really wasn't, uh, I was, I was very surprised. Um, a lot more, um, I, I, I used this description before, but a lot more um, dynamics, meaning um, if any musicians out there um, taking small steps, it's working with me in nice little small steps. Um, so if you, you know, you need to be light on the keys, it's, um, it's there for you. If you need to really, you know, power through something, pick up your pace, it's there. It's matching what you're putting out. So um, uh, it, it really wasn't difficult at all. Even as far as stairs, I, I managed to trigger the stair mode and immediately, uh, right off the bat. Even sit, stand right away. Uh, I, I remember just being really surprised by that because you really had to kind of mash down on the heel uh, with the initial uh, iteration. So it was um, big, big improvement for me. Big change. Um, very easy to use. Thank you, Paul. In fact, Paul, I think as you as you relate that story, I think I was that person that was standing next to you saying, yes, just go ahead and walk or yes, just go ahead and stand right. by the chair. Uh, and and that, is, uh, th that is the type of instruction we are able to give to people with, with power knee. We're always there to back up if there's any challenges, but and many people can get right up out of a chair and experience what the power knee can can offer to them and same with walking uh we're, we're reducing our instruction down to a bare minimum uh, and that's uh, that's exciting it's a kudos to the engineers uh designing this new uh version of the power knee dr gailey uh, i have a question for you uh what is important for a physical therapist to know when uh starting functional training with a powered prosthesis uh great question um you know therapists we get technical we want to tell the person you need to think about this, do that, do the other thing. And one of the things that I've learned, and it took me a while because I can be technical, is to don't know, to ask your patient not to overthink it, just to do what they did before. And by doing that, the person kind of takes away the focus from what the prosthesis is doing to what they need to do. So now is what we basically what we want to look at as just basically being a, a form of motor control where it's a goal oriented activity. I need you to be able to walk from here to there. I need you to walk to take shorter steps. Now I want you to speed up and take slightly longer steps, but lead with the sound limb. So what I've been doing is asking people to think about the intact limb and let the prosthetic limb follow. And therefore, it becomes goal-oriented therapy with the emphasis on the human body, not on the prosthesis. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, Bob. Uh, Paul, one more question for you before uh, we, we get back into our content. Uh, is is uh, Some of you may have noticed, and you'll see in the next section some information about this, but you may have noticed uh, how Paul lands on the prosthesis. Paul, do you notice anything different in how you landed on this prosthesis versus other other knees that you've had in the past? Uh, and we'll explain this a little bit further, but tell us a little bit about your experience with the, the stance flexion feeling that you have with, with this new power knee. Yeah, uh, so the way that you're landing on it, you're landing, it's um, slight, slightly bent even. And I, I remember initially, um, it took a moment. I noticed it almost immediately, but then as I'm walking around, it's, it, um, it really just felt more natural. And you, and you kind of build that trust with your, uh, prosthesis over time anyway, whether, you know, it's initially, um, where you need to, that that's a big leap. Um, when you first, uh, become an amputee and you're, you're learning to gain that trust, uh, with your, you know, with your new device, with the, with your, uh, leg, but, um, uh, it's it's a very brief moment after you know I've I've experienced that sort of thing before, but it, it just feels more natural to me. Um, it it kind of matches my. It feels more like my other leg um, to me. Just that that knee joint, that slight bent, uh, landed. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. And before we we begin the next section here, uh, keep in mind that the Q and A section. 
uh, or, or tab is open for your use uh, throughout the time. You don't have to wait till one of the discussion times. And, and we encourage you to bring on your questions and maybe that will, will happen as you see some of the more content that we have here. Uh, expanding on that idea of stance flexion, if you look at the far right icon there, there's a little one with an arrow right around the knee. And, and the power knee uh, actually is designed with when someone lands on the prosthesis, the power knee uh, does not go to full extension, but it stops just short of full extension. So when someone lands on the prosthesis, they're landing in a slightly bent position, which might seem a little bit unusual for us to be considering that, but it is more natural in our normal gait. Uh, and this is one of those changes that I think we're going to see uh, of what people expect differently from a prosthesis. But the reason it's possible and the reason that's a good idea is that the power knee, when it goes to full extension and swing phase, creates a lock even before the patient lands on it. And then when they land on it, the knee stays locked, but allows up to seven degrees of more stance flexion, of additional stance flexion. And then during mid stance or late stance, it actually allows stance extension. So it has some cushioning or buffer when someone lands on the prosthesis. The intuitiveness of the power knee also makes it a lot easier to do turns. Uh, there's less involved involvement and the knee is following what the user intends. It's possible to kneel and get lift from a kneeling position with the power knee. And then also we have an exercise mode that allows us to put the knee into a, a, a low friction uh, mode, if you will, or free motion. So Bob is gonna give us just a little bit of insight as to how this can influence the, the rehab process. Thanks, Kurt. Well, I believe that as prosthetists and therapists, we're in the business of fall prevention. Um, falls is probably one of the most expensive healthcare economic issues that we face, even more so than heart disease. And um, where do most of the falls occur? In the home. Why we spend a lot of time or more time in the home than anywhere else, especially over the last couple of years. But the idea of teaching somebody how to be able to negotiate the obstacles, and there are obstacles in, in the home, more so than just to throw rug and Fido lying there in the corner, um, there are uh, issues that people have to negotiate every single day. In fact, if you think about it, 81% of daily walking takes place in bouts lasting less than 60 seconds, less than a minute with um, less than basically uh, 40 continuous steps. Um, we also see that 35 to 45% of all steps involve a turn. And we turn just under 900 times a day, almost 65 turns occur every single hour. And if you're a person with lower limb loss, you walk in bouts of about one to two minutes on average and taking less than 17 steps, which is considerably less than the, the numbers I gave you for uh, non-amputee folks. Um, and so what the CDC has identified is difficulty with walking turns, weakness, balance, and vision problems is what leads to falls in people uh, over the age of 65. In short, is being able to walk short distances and turns and make and and negotiate turns and have that type of mobility is imperative for a person wearing a prosthesis. So this is why one of the first things that we do with our folks is after they learn walking is we have them walk and do repeated turns. Now, Repeated turns and just turning alone, if you go back even five or 10 years in my career, which is a subspecialty, I'd have influential people that wanted to be able to turn without looking like they were wearing a prosthesis. They would come and some people would stay for a week to learn all the nuances to be able to have a smooth transitioning turn. With a power knee, all you have to do is walk as naturally as you did um, uh, or as you do on the uh, intact limb, or as you did before you wore a prosthesis. So the idea is maintaining that pelvic rotation, keeping your feet apart, not forcing the turn, just allowing the turn to take place. And you can see as Paul's walking here, we asked him to do this activity and picked it up in literally minutes, uh, as opposed to days, if not weeks, for some of the folks I worked with before. In addition, um, turning 
to one direction, to one side, the left side, and then the right side is difficult. That's why we do figure eights. And this allows people to negotiate through the living room, their kitchen, through the bedroom, in a restaurant, uh, when they go into the community and just know that they can do it in a nice, comfortable manner. They don't have to get nervous. They don't have to do something special. And in my mind, this means a reduction in falls. A reduction in falls is a reduction in healthcare costs. And it gets people who potentially might not want to venture into the community out and about. So I think this is a great feature because of, as Kurt said, that active flexion and extension that takes place in the knee is what makes this so simple for people to learn. We uh, had a little bit of discussion and Paul was alluding to this flexion that takes place um, when he walks. So as you can see, Allison's pulling his knee forward and he's, she's getting that 10 to 15 degrees of knee flexion, not that takes place as the knee flexes and extends uh, when performing a stride, but that's for the stance flexion. That happens during loading response when the body weight is coming down onto the knee to help with that sinusoidal curve of walking theoretically to reduce energy costs and also to absorb shock or create shock attenuation as the person walks. To slow it down and what it looks like um, is you can see as Paul's walking, he got that feeling. Now, oftentimes what we'll do is when somebody's learning how to do that motion, and I have a small freeze frame there, you can see he's actually getting that flexion takes place. Now we've heard it for years with microprocessors and in the nineties, there were a few mechanical knees that offered stance flexion. Most of the people in my experience never took advantage of it. Once they felt that knee start to buckle, they would use their hip extensors and say, nope, that feels like falling, not gonna happen. The neat thing is having that confidence in the limb and knowing that flexion can take place, yet you're not going to see the knee buckle or you're not going to experience a fall, um, I think is a huge advantage. And so um, it's just another one of those features. And by the way, the stepping backwards and forwards and getting a person comfortable with it usually happens in the parallel bars. Um, we were just doing video without parallel bars, but I would suggest get the person's confidence in the parallel bars then let them go into the community. The other thing is kneeling. So most people find it difficult to get up and on the floor or having to do things um, around the house that are low. And notice all Allison did was say, hey, bend your knee, then stand up. You notice the knee assisted him in extending. So he was able to stand up just like he would use his quads under a normal uh, situation. And then if she wants him to kneel on the prosthetic limb, you just bend the knee like you normally do. Remind me what I used to do before I wore prosthesis. He bends the knee and as he comes down, the knee allows him to bend and then he goes ahead and stands up and walks away. And I just want to replay this one time because I want you to notice is that as Allison goes down, she bends her knee and the knee goes down and she stands up, she lifts and she kicks her leg forward. When he bends down with the power knee, the knee bends, he gets comfortable, he stands up, he lifts the leg and it kicks forward. It's exactly what the intact limb does when he's walking. So again, it's just reminding the person what they used to do. When it comes to exercise, one of the keys is building up a person's endurance, trying to get them back into the gym, giving them back the opportunity to uh, restore their physical fitness. Now, one of the interesting things is that the power knee does have an exercise mode. And there's a specific reason for this is when you set the resistance, let's say on the exercise machine, you're gauging or you're modifying that resistance for what you're looking for from that machine for your daily exercise. But if the exercise mode was not on the knee, the knee would provide resistance. So now you're having to fight the resistance of the knee as well as having to fight the resistance of the machine. So the exercise mode allows somebody to gauge their own resistance for their own individual fitness program and not have to worry about the knee. And then once they get off the exercise bike, they move out of the exercise mode, and then they're good to go about their daily activities. Um, so with that, um, I'll return it back to Kurt, 
and to Paul and uh, take maybe a few more questions. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll start off with a with a question for for you, uh, and it comes from Michael Nelson. Michael, thank you for asking a question. You get the bonus. You you asked a two part question. I'll give half of it to Bob, and I'll take the rest of it. Uh, Bob, the question is for you. Do you recommend Powerney uh, for a new amputee? Um, it's a great question. So uh, there was an interesting concept that developed out of Walter Reed and the process working and physical therapists working with our service members. And they found that when they were using the second generation of power knee is the service members accelerated through their rehabilitation and hence the term accelerated rehab with the use of the power knee because the knee um, provided that active flexion and extension. And they were seeing in uh, some members that were coming back is that they kind of flew right through uh, rehab, just like what we're describing now. In fact, um, they uh, sought funding and there's an ongoing research program that's looking at uh, the accelerated rehab uh, program. So um, again, uh, it's a new release with this device. We did see that accelerated rehab with uh, Power Knee 2. I can tell you in the short period of time that I've had to work with this knee, I think that if a person meets the criteria um, that Kurt will probably outline in just a second for the Power Knee, as a therapist, going back to those first couple of slides, if I can decrease the time for basic strengthening and balance, if I can decrease the time that I have to educate a person about the prostheses and spend most of my time on functional skills, I'm all in, I'm all for it, and it seems to make sense. Kurt? Thank you, Bob. I'll come back with uh, contraindications and indications in just a little bit. Uh, uh, Paul, a question for you uh, that came from this morning is, is what do you find uh, you benefit the most from Power Knee? Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's that balance, but uh, in particular, uh, I, and I mentioned this again this morning, but uh, waking up, first thing I did, you know, put on the leg, um, went, grabbed my daughter out of bed, have a two-year-old daughter, and she, she gets pretty clingy in the morning uh, to the point where she won't let me put her down. <laughs> so I basically walk around doing everything, um, you know, getting her dressed, getting, you know, run around everything, making breakfast. So even sitting down, um, she didn't want me to put her, you know, put her back down or anything. So I was able to stand up with her, put my evenly distribute my weight through both sides. And that's something I can't do with um, a uh, non-powered uh, medical device where it's, I, I mean, I can, but I'm really using that sound side more than anything. Um, and, and there's just, there's no way around it. Um, you're, you're going to, um, even no matter how developed you are on that, uh, prosthetic side. So for me, it's that, and just feeling that balance, being able to go step over, step upstairs. Um, that's huge. And it's, uh, I mean, it's not even worth it if it's so difficult to trigger that you can't even use the function, but I don't experience that at all with this. So, um, I think it's I think it's very practical. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, Michael, I'll, I'll expand on on your question uh, as well. Uh, part of your question was, uh, what are the contraindications and indications of power knee? Uh, there there are a couple of things to to keep in mind here. Um, the overriding statement is that we've seen power in the power knee be able to benefit people from all the way up at a K four level amputee to uh, down at the lower mobility levels as well. In fact, we're very intent on, on delivering a powered prosthesis to that level of amputee as well. In the US, there are limitations with K level and our, so our target become, in regards to Medicare and insurance companies. So you have a, you have a limiter in, in a K3 population uh, for insurance coverage for the power knee. But again, I'll say that we've seen benefit beyond that scope and, and we believe there will be uh, proven up benefit down the road for that. Uh, some, some contraindications would be our weight limit is at 256 pounds, which is 116 kilos. Uh, that's one of the limitations. A, an indication or other group of people that can, can benefit from power knee is that we are successfully fitting bilateral transfemorals, of course, bilateral transtibial transfemoral level amputees, and also using the power knee at, uh, at the hip disarticulation level 
uh, as well. Uh, so we see a, a fairly broad application. And as Bob mentioned, that early early amputees or early use of a prosthesis after, after amputation has been uh, is, is a very viable solution. And we've seen that being successful as well, um, particularly because of the, the intuitiveness of the knee. Uh, we'll move on to our next section here and uh, and answer some of the other lingering questions that's, that might still be there. We'll have no, one more session, so please keep your questions coming. Uh, the next section we're going to talk about ramps, uh, uh, both ascent and descent, and and uh, Bob will just give us a little bit of information about how the the power knee operates or how we can provide rehab. But uh, something about how it operates is that uh, if someone's going on a ramp, they have the choice on such uh, such as maybe a really shallow ramp to walk as they do on level ground, keep the prosthesis relatively straight, and, and walk in the same manner. Uh, as a level ground, but when someone gets to a, a slightly steeper ramp, uh, you'll see that it's more beneficial that uh, somebody uh, yields the knee or lets it bend and lets the knee give them resistance while the knee is bending uh, and it lowers them down uh, gently in that regard. You will see in these next videos that Paul can exemplify both of those activities on the same level of ramp and, and Paul, excuse me, Bob will comment on that a little bit. You'll notice there's a picture of a battery and a charger here. Uh, uh, Paul already mentioned the battery life for this this power knee is 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 much longer. It's 25 hours, and the charger no longer needs a backpack to hold it. Uh, you can stick it in your pocket. Basically, it's the same charger that's, that is used for the rio knee and the proprio foot. So there are two batteries with every power knee. It is a replaceable battery. Uh, so if someone goes through a high level of activity during a day, they can easily swap out the next battery. Uh, but most people are able to get through an entire day already with the single battery that's on board. Uh, Bob, I'll leave it to you to, to show us how we can help uh, improve somebody's gait, both up and down ramps. Great. Thanks, Kirk. So uh, here's the uh pre-training and paul's walking up the ramp and honestly if uh, somebody walked into most of our clinics and said i need some ramp training you'd ask why um and he's basically just in the walking mode and uh, he's applying the same things that he does when he walks now a couple of things that we may want to take a look at is can we get a little bit more flexion what have you but for the most part he does quite well but here's the training that we would do with folks as they come in. All we want to do is remind them that you have to rotate the pelvis, you roll over the toe, that's going to get knee flexion and initiate that knee flexion. We know that the power knee is also going to accentuate that because it's going to have that flexion component. And once the person gets the feel, oh yeah, I just have to uh, lead with my hip on the prosthetic side, roll over my sound side foot, and then uh, she'll just let him go up the, the ramp and get the feel of what it's like to ascend the ramp. Then she'll just put it into play where she'll go up and down the ramp and give them that feel. It's just like you walk. The knee will take care of the rest. So, and it's really just kind of those same principles as you go up the ramp. And then after a little bit of practice, he gets a little more arm swing. Maybe he's got a scooch more knee flexion that's taking place, but he's essentially just walking right up the ramp and the knee is assisting him. And if you look between both this intact limb and the prosthetic limb, they're pretty darn symmetrical as he negotiates going up the ramp. So the next is... Um, uh, going up the ramp with small steps and this is typically more difficult but in rainy uh slippery uh situations uh as we're going into winter if you live in an area of the country where there's ice you notice that we all take smaller steps when we're in slipperier situations and notice that he's able to take slow symmetrical short steps a very difficult task especially when you're going uphill but the knee allows him to do that just by following the intact limb keeping his pelvis moving rolling with the toe but he really doesn't have to think about it just walk take baby steps and you'll get right up the ramp going down the ramp oftentimes this is more difficult we ask the person to ride the knee down as they 
uh, go down the ramp and to try to preserve the intact limb. And then um, Paul is fairly accomplished. Most people will end up landing on the toe of their sound limb because they can get the foot down faster to catch them. Uh, he obviously is an accomplished walker, but you can see that sense of as it come down, the foot slapping, more forces going down through the intact limb. So the idea is to reduce the forces that are going through the intact limb, as you see him do it slow motion, be able to use the braking mechanism or yielding mechanism with inside the power knee. How do we do that? We just need to get his weight over the knee and it will take care of the rest. So what we want him to do is fire the hip extensors. He fires the hip extensors. He keeps the pelvis in neutral so it doesn't go into the anterior tilt. He then keeps the posture of the trunk over the knee. The information into the knee is his full weight bearing as he's going down, the knee will lock. Now this knee actually will adjust if he doesn't get it 100%, but we want to get it as close to what the knee would expect for somebody with his body weight as possible. So all Allison's doing is getting him to fire the hip extensors, not to control the knee, but to control his posture. So as he descends the stairs, he'll walk in more upright posture and he can take a slow and controlled step with the sound limb. The other reminder is don't forget that you have to rotate your pelvis as you're going down uh, the, the uh, ramp or the incline. And so she just gives a little bit of an input to remind him to make sure that you have symmetry at the pelvis that you're using your body the way the body was intended. And at the end, you can see he's more upright as he's walking down. He's loading the knee, uh, the prosthetic knee, as he's lowering the contralateral foot and he's getting a nice low step. And the key is that he's coming down on the heel and lowering the foot down. And with practice and time, it can get even better. And as you see in slow motion, all we wanna do is ride the knee down, but look how vertical his trunk is. Look how he's able to keep his pelvis in a neutral position. He just fires the hamstring, he loads the limb, and he takes a controlled step going down. If it's a slippery situation, you want shorter steps, more difficult. Most knees don't bend as quickly as the power knee does. And as you see, he can take nice, slow, controlled steps. Um, if he's in a situation where, you know what, I really just want to get down this ramp and and make sure that I do it successfully, which is the biggest fear for most people who wear a prosthesis. And as you can see, he can do that quite well. One last thing that we asked Paul to do, if any of us have been hiking or been uneven terrain, as we go down, you don't take equal steps. You don't even take short equal steps. You take one short step, one long step, one medium step, one long step, one short step, uh, depending on the demands of that terrain. And notice that with this knee, he can take short steps, longer steps, and the knee follows and takes almost exactly the same step as his anatomical knee does or his anatomical limb so that he can go out into the environment and he can walk with a fair degree of symmetry and most importantly, security as he goes down any kind of incline or hill. Um, so with that, the uh, final piece we want to talk about is stairs. And I'll turn it back to Kurt, who will tell us a little bit about the features for stairs in the power knee. Yes, thank you, Bob. Uh, one, one thought about uh, ramp descent or a ramp ascent is, is that uh, is, is the patient doing anything, or I'm sorry, is the, is the patient, what is the patient experiencing when they're going up ramps? Something that we've had feedback from many users on ramp ascent is that um, the ability to get the leg to the next next area on the ramp forward seems much easier than it has been you know, with other knees. It's just an anecdotal feedback that we've been getting along the time here. Uh, on ramp descent, uh, the, the way that the, pro the prosthesis extends in late swing is based on how the person is moving their thigh forward during swing. So if the person is being more aggressive and flicking their leg out forward, the knee will get out to full extension faster. If they're just being passive and uh, taking slower strides, uh, the knee will follow that motion as well. 
But for stair descent, uh, we know we want that prosthesis out and ready for that next step below. Uh, so the knee behaves slightly differently. What it does is it automatically uh, fires the extension power and gets the leg out to full extension during swing. So it's prepared to accept weight on it by the user uh, each and every step. The little iPad sitting here is just a reminder for me to tell you that the interface between power knee and uh, any electronic device is through OSER logic, which is what we use for Proprio and Rio. And, and so the connectivity to the power knee is much simpler, much easier. Uh, so the process of fitting a power knee is much easier for us all as well. Bob, I'll take it back to you then. Great, thanks Kurt. So uh, descending the stairs, there are so many ways to get downstairs. We all have to do it. And if you're wearing a prosthesis, um, this can be a scary thing. So step two step descent is the safest way. And we always recommend to people, first and foremost, it doesn't matter how you look getting down the stairs, you got to get down the stairs safely. So doing a step two step is a very common way, especially on older folks getting down the stairs. The other is we had the partial foot. This is where you get half the foot over and you kind of roll through. And this has been um, pretty popular now with the advent of the microprocessor knees. Um, the foot doesn't allow me to get all the way down. The knee braking system doesn't work quite the way I want it to do. So uh, many of us who have been doing prosthetic training have done this partial step and you ride the knee down, but you still come down with a lot of force onto the intact limb. The jackknife was a way for years we taught folks, especially before MPKs became available. Yeah, you just jackknife and a person could do this. This was terrific rehab um, back in the day, mechanical knees, just jackknife over and that's leg over leg. But look at the amount of abuse that takes place on the intact limb. Then we have a few other favorites, the abducted limb for uh, mostly older folks that couldn't bend the knee, didn't trust the knee, and you kind of did a step two where you lean way over onto that intact limb to get down the stairs. And then for the more adventurous of the folks that had difficulty getting down the stairs, we always had the abducted narrow gate where now you try to bring the uh, sound limb closer to midline because you didn't really trust anything in there, the guardrails or what have you, and you got down the stairs. Um, so there's a variety of ways that folks figure out how to safely get down the stairs. So what we have to do with the power knee, it's quite simple. It goes back to the same principles. Just teach the person to maintain the posture, use their hip extensors to go down the stairs. And by using the hip extensors to get down, whoops, back, they use the hip extensors to get down the stairs. All they're doing, all Allison is doing at this time is putting her hand on the back of his, of uh, Paul's thigh to get him to fire the hamstrings. Again, not to control the knee, but to keep his body upright. You need to use a little muscle just in order to maintain normal anatomical posture. Once you do that, then you can try going down the stairs, doing this right off the bat at the top of the stairs is scary. Nobody wants to do it. Um, but after you do a few, as we just showed in the prior uh, uh, videos, is, is doing a couple at the bottom of the stairs, then the therapist really gets a workout trying to match the resistance because you're not using the hip extensors throughout the stair step just enough to maintain your weight over the knee and then allow the person to release. That's actually how we use our muscles on the intact limb going down the stairs. It's just getting that same natural symmetrical motion. Once you get that symmetrical motion, then the person can learn how to go step by step down the stairs and use the knee. Now, why would we do this? Well, not everybody is going to be as functional as Paul, and we still want folks to get down safely, but Paul's using more of the resistance of the power knee, even as he goes step by step, and he may want to use this in um, you know, a few situations where it's icy or he does is this a, a slippery stairwell. However, um, obviously not holding on to anything. His foot is all the way back. 
gives him a better platform. You see the heel coming to the edge and he's just rolling right down the stairs as he comes down. So he looks down, he's taking the foot. It's not a partial foot, it's not a jackknife, it's a controlled descent. And look at that look at the end of the stairs. Oh, that looks like a superhero to me. So then um, we have to talk about stair ascent. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kurt, who will tell us about one of the features with stair ascent. Simply put is that the motor power helps uh, once you load the prosthesis, create a slight extension moment, it's going to provide lift. When you subsequently place your foot on the next step with the prosthesis going up, it's going to give powered extension. And just the matter is a matter or the, the next task is a matter of making sure your patient can be balanced over the prosthesis while it lifts them. Um, Bob, we also have some some great great questions that are that are piling in here, and they're wonderful things. So may I make the suggestion that we skip past those initial training uh, steps and move into a little bit further on with the stairs, so we have time to answer everyone's questions. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So what we will do is just show the pre, if you don't mind, Kurt. So perfect. This is. Um, so if somebody were able to negotiate stairs, like we're seeing uh, Paul here, and in this case, he's in a microprocessor knee, you can see how we spent so much time teaching a person to pull the leg back and to step up the stairs, pull the leg back, step up the stairs. And so this would have been celebrated even today that somebody could negotiate the stairs like this except if you're the person walking directly behind them going up the stairs because you're dodging to the left and to the right. So now if we look, and I'm just going to show this first one, is notice how he steps up and he comes up. He's got both his hip extensors and the actuator of the knee teaching somebody how to step up the stairs. You notice how the knee hangs down so he can find that step and we don't have to do anything special as we have to in other uh, uh, situations. And so then after that, it's now teaching them how to step over step to get up the stairs. And we can do a couple stairs at a time and the knee is right there for them. So then at the end of the day, it's a matter of just having to do step by step, one leg over the other, the knee flexes so he can put it right on the next step as he goes up, he gets up to the top and that's all. It's a small, a small activation kick to let the knee know, hey, we're done with stairs, now we're ready to walk. If he's walking up the stairs and there's somebody blocking him, like his therapist who doesn't want him to go any further, he gets up to the stop and he just stops right there and he's safely in a standing position. So the idea is that he can stand, or go ascend the stairs quite easily. When he does the exit, he pauses and the uh, just right there, or he can go all the way up let the knee know that I'm going to go out of the stair mode at the top. And that's the only time you see a small little uh, flexion of the knee, not that violent kick that we've become to know with teaching somebody how to use an MPK. And so finally we see stair ascent and it looks about as smooth as it can be. You notice there's not any exaggerated motions, no kicking. Um, it just looks about as natural as can be. So in summary, we used to look at strength and balance, prosthetic training, and functional training. We thought we could kind of divide it up to thirds and traditional. Never happened. We spent most of the time preparing the person for the prostheses. This is how you use the prostheses. And then a little bit of time was spent on functional training. However, if we can give them stability, confidence, we can get early mobility. If we can get early mobility and teach them not to focus on the prosthesis, but to feel more intuitive and they know that the knee will adapt to the task, then we can spend the time on functional training and this idea of IPA rehab, intuitive powered accelerated rehab will allow us to do what we all wanna do, whether it's prosthetists or physical therapists, we wanna teach the person to do the things that they want to do in the home, the community, and with their family. And all we have to do is to remind them to do what they did before. The knee will take care of the rest. And with that, Kurt, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, we still have a, a fair amount of time allowed, and I think this will be beneficial. We've got 
a good number of questions. So we're going to mix things up just a little bit. This is a surprise for, for all of us. Um, we're, what we're going, all of us working on this webinar. Uh, I'm going to get the first few questions answered and then Jan from Denmark is gonna help us out with asking the questions live uh, so we can more easily get through the questions. Uh, so I'll start off, uh, one of the first questions that we have here is, um, and this is why I'm gonna have Jan step in because the uh, first question is, is for you, Bob. It is about, uh, is there any published uh, literature out there that references the accelerated rehab with power knee? To my knowledge, no. Um, we I only know of one study, and that was the one I mentioned uh, at Walter Reed. Uh, power knee is still relatively new. Uh, it really never made it into the mainstreams for a number of blockers that were out there with reimbursement and uh, other issues. Um, but we hope to make that uh, something that is available to the rehab population, uh, the rehab community as soon as possible. And, and I'll say if there's any researchers out there that are interested in helping with this, please be in contact with us and we were, we're happy to help figure these things out for sure. Uh, next question is from US Calcon, uh, which is, um, it's those, this is both for Paul and myself. Uh, Paul, I'll ask you first, does the, does the power need, the question is, does the power need recognize the difference between level ground and ramps uh, to increase the knee flexion? Uh, I'm going to rephrase that for you, Paul. Uh, do you do anything, do you feel like you're doing anything different between level ground and walking up ramps when you're on the prosthesis? Uh, going up the ramps? I don't know that I feel anything very different. Um, one thing I know that I was I, I was doing incorrectly initially uh, when I went to a, a powered knee was I was still trying to kick out a little bit. This was more of an initial thing, uh, and you really got to kind of let the knee do that sort of movement for you a little bit more. Um, other than that, I'm not really doing too much different. Yeah, that is a common thing that uh, the more active the person is, uh, the more they'll uh, they might still be trying to uh, drive the leg forward themselves when ultimately they can rely on the knee to help them with that. Uh, it's a common thing that we experience. I'll answer the question from my perspective, is the knee recognizing a difference between level ground walking and ramp ascent? And the answer in, in the large part is, is no, but one thing that is going to be noticed by the knee is that the it always is responsive to, to cadence and essentially the speed at which someone is walking. So if someone's going up a, a ramp more slowly, as you saw with Paul, it's going to give a more modified approach and, and not overstep. Uh, but if they're moving up the ramp more quickly with larger steps, it will match that as well. So that applies both to level ground and to ramps. And so the difference between those is all handled because of the way the knee just operates in, in walking. Uh, our, our third question here then is uh, from Andrew, and it is around, uh, has this been Andrew Reimer? Um, I, I had to reach out to my daughter, uh, and, and I don't know if this Andrew Reimer is the same one I know, but this is somebody that I think was in my daughter's high school class. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I doubt that's really the case. But Andrew asked the question, has this knee been used with osseointegration patients? And um, the answer uh, largely is no. There have been maybe one or two very special cases in very well monitored situations uh, where that has been done. However, with new power knee, it is not yet uh, approved for use with osseointegrated patients. That being said, we have there is a study being started in uh, in the beginning of next year, uh, may even start the end of this year, and it's going to be going throughout 2022. And we will be uh, assessing that and hopefully having some results from that study that allow us to make. A, uh, a statement one way or the other to let you know what the results are and whether we can use power knee with osteointegrated patients. With that, I'm gonna switch it up and have Jan who is on screen here. Jan, you've got the questions in front of you and I'll let you uh, just ask them one by one. Sure, uh, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, uh, the first one here is from Mo Moises Fennel and the question uh, goes to probably both a uh, combination between Bob and yourself here, Kurt. Will you be recommending stair ascent and descent for bilateral power knee users? 
Bob, I'll take this first and let you follow. Uh, um, we can, for, for bilateral users, we, we at this point, and the way that uh, that we've done it with Pyrene 2 in the past is that we are able to allow bilateral transformal users to go up one step at a time. So a step by step approach or step two approach. So lifting with one side and letting the other one follow. Uh, we are early in our stages of this new power knee in using it with bilaterals. We have validated the use. Uh, but uh, we will probably be uh, able to see some of those results in the field. Uh, it's, it's a possibility, but it's not anything that's been uh, guaranteed yet to go step over step. Going in descent, it is totally possible for a bilateral transformer to go downstairs uh, in a bilateral, in a step over step fashion with Powerney. Um, it takes a little bit of skill set and a little bit of gumption to do that, but it is possible. Bob, any thoughts from a therapy perspective? Uh, all I can do is is rely on history. When we first started looking at MPKs, uh, they were not advised for bilaterals, and then they became the knee that was often recommended for bilaterals. What we need to do is get them on users, and we need to learn from the people using them what are the triggers, what are the intricate little nuances of using a knee that will help other people to follow behind them. So uh, again, we're in our infancy with this development, but it's very, very promising. Just haven't been there yet. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, the next one here that I'm going to pick is from uh, Bobby, that is, who's asking, uh, and this is, for, this is for you, Paul. You can answer this one probably. What foot uh, you are working on, and also, uh, secondly, what is the suspension in the socket? Yeah, um, I, uh, first, the socket. Uh, I, I wear a flexible uh, brim, uh, low-profile socket, so um, it's, uh, I don't know if I need much more description there, um, but uh, I, as well as um, the foot, uh, I use a ProFlex pivot, but I've also used the ProFlex XC as well. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they, they, they both uh, respond a little bit differently, but um, as far as I think that uh, Pivot is a really good combination for the uh, ramps going uh, up and down, also the stairs as well. Um, I actually experienced that a little bit myself at the airport the other day. Um, There's a lot of subtle ramps everywhere. Um, and that was really, um, it was, I put it to some use, uh, quite a bit of use, and I was, I was actually impressed with that combination. Great. Thank you, uh, Paul. And here's, uh, here's one for, for you then, kind of up the same alley, Kurt. Any uh, experience in using uh, the power knee paired with a proprio uh, versus, yeah, the, the pivot like Paul was talking about, or the LP torsion? Yes, uh, and generally speaking, we will recommend power knee across all ProFlex uh, foot family and, and have the, the proprio included into that. So we have had uh, successful fittings with power knee and proprio combination. It really works well together. Uh, the, the power knee and pivot works well. Sometimes we'll make a slight plantar flexion of that foot uh, to accommodate for its, its uh, fairly large dorsiflexion range. Uh, and then all of the ProFlex family feet work well with Pyrene. Great. Then uh, we have a triple question here from Ren. Uh, let's see. First of all, asking about fitting uh, this to knee disarticulation. I guess that the, the problem here, of course, is, is build height. And then I'm asking about the weight and the, uh, the noise of the knee as well, Kurt. I'll take those first two and a half yeah. and then yeah. hand the, have the noise over, over to Paul as well. Um, the, the knee disarticulation, um, as long as you have room for a, uh, for, for a low profile foot underneath uh, that, that person, uh, you can get fine function of the power knee. The sit to stand function will be less symmetrical as, as would be obvious. Uh, but the functionality in, in level ground walking and ramps and descent activities is, is quite uh, functional. And now I'm blanking on that second question all of a sudden. Uh, weight. 
Off the, the power weight knee. of the knee is uh, five and a half pounds, and translate that into into kilograms. That I think it's right around three or or uh, two and a half kilograms, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then finally, noise. Um, the knee has sound, and, and I'm starting to believe that uh, some of the sound not only is 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 more than a nuisance. Uh, let me say that again. Uh, some people will consider it a nuisance. Uh, but we have had some people refer to this as as feedback uh, that they use for identifying how they walk. Let me tell you a little bit about the noise and, and the level of it. Uh, the the decibels that it puts out is about 56 and a half. I wouldn't expect anybody to know exactly what that is, but that's somewhere between a household refrigerator and, and a normal conversation. Normal conversation in a room is about 63 decibels. So if you're walking into a room with, with normal conversation, you're likely not to hear someone walking in with power knee. Uh, there was a conversation that just happened earlier this week between two amputees on power knee, and one of them said, how have you acclimated to the noise? And, and the, the, the person responded with, with this statement and said, I stopped thinking about the noise when I felt better. And, and this, was, this is an answer that occurred within five days of, of this person wearing the power knee. And, and so that is something that we can't study that very easily, but we are starting to see that type of response. And then I'll hand it over to Paul. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with, with the sound that comes from power knee? Yeah, uh, well, I, I a lot of times find myself kind of listening for that, <laughs> listening for it sometimes. Um, but really, when you're in kind of, if you're in like a crowded area or at the mall, uh, more than a couple people in the room, a lot of times you really don't even hear it or even wearing a pair of pants kind of dampens it to an effect as well. Um, but I, I've, I've spoken to uh, many other people that have also worn the power knee. And I know that... Uh, a lot of them actually they prefer that noise it doesn't bother me at all um actually I, I kind of forget about it a lot of times until uh well my, my daughter uh calls me a robot now she loves it um absolutely <laughs> i got up from the dinner table the other night she said no robot come back and she's constantly having me go up and down stairs for her she, she loves it they think it's the coolest thing but um as far as the noise goes it's um it's pretty subtle i think um and you know it, it's a lot of personal preference you might have some people uh newer amputees who are kind of like re redefining their own image where you know that they might be sensitive to that um where on the other side of that you might have some you know strong type a personalities that kind of relish the attention they, you know they might get from it in certain scenarios you know um so and i've seen that as well um i've seen people you know they they enjoy that uh, sort of thing, but um, it, it's not something you notice all the time and in every um, environment either. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. Um, let's see. Uh, there's another one here from SCIL Prosthetics about the suitability for uh, with the knee in terms of using it for running and and playing, you know, sports, basketball, and stuff like that. It is power knee is not indicated for high impact activities. It's indicated for low and moderate uh, level activities uh, or impact activities. So, um, so no, it is not suited for for running or playing sports such as basketball. Great. Then, uh, very interesting one here that uh, at this time of year just came in from Erin. What's the thres threshold for wearing it out in the cold of winter? before affecting a function? And, and uh, what about with regards to potentially getting it wet when wa walk, walking in the rain and, and being out and about? Well, I will, I will answer this first part and then I'm gonna put the other one to Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, you guys are gonna enjoy this one. Um, but uh, but the, in the winter, we test the knee down to 10 degrees Celsius, which is negative, which is um, negative 10 degrees Celsius, which is 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 40 Celsius. Uh, so those are our testing zones and, 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 and uh, it's, it's functional in, in that range. Um, regarding getting it wet, I will say this much. Um, it's, uh, it gave a whole new meaning uh, in our discussions just today 
about uh, IPA rehab, and, and Paul's going to tell us about this. Uh, but the new power knee is what we refer to at OSER as being weatherproof. So walking in the rain is totally fine. If you if you if you splash something on it, get it with sudsy water, that kind of thing, just rinse it off. And if you happen to spill an IPA beer on it, just rinse it off. It will be fine. But Paul's going to tell us just real briefly why that's an important detail to know. <laughs> so uh, I was also one of the first users of the second iteration of the Power Knee. And uh, the very first day that I had it, um, I actually was going on a first date. This is years ago. And um, I, I didn't get a second. But um, <laughs> so... <laughs> The, uh, so what ended up happening was um, it had been raining outside. So walking in, floor was still kind of wet. I went to sit down. I had ordered a beer, sat it down on the table, went to sit down. Floor was wet. Knee hadn't disengaged yet. Slid out, kicked the table out from under me. Beer went all over the, the knee. And it ended up malfunctioning pretty hard. I started um, doing like Chuck Norris style roundhouse kicks around the, the bar. And uh, ended up... <laughs> And trying to wrestle the thing, turn it off, got out of there and um, turned the thing back in, got a call later in the week from someone in Iceland, long number on my phone. Um, and they said, Hey, um, what did, what did you do to this? I was like, Oh, you know, I got it wet. And they're like, um, it, it, it smells fermented. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> but it was the beer. And with, with this latest one, um, actually I took a shower with it this morning. So it's, um, no issues. And um, I can set it down on the side of the pool if I'm swimming laps or something like that. But um, yeah, it's, not no meant for, it's not meant for immersion, um, but it, it will take spray splash of water from any direction. And it'll be fine. So uh, so you do not have to relive Paul's story of, of spilling a beer on it uh, and it will be it will be absolutely fine. So we're happy to have that improvement as well. Uh, I, let's take two more questions, Jan. I know sure. we're just a couple minutes over, um, sure. and then we'll, um, we'll wrap it up. Two more, and we can be we can be finished up. Sure, we'll do that. Uh, and and I guess we it's kind kind of a combination here from Chatri and 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 from Jackie about suggested paperwork for L code on the website and and issues about getting insurance coverage. Firstly, I'll cover the the insurance. Uh, Medicare has had a code for this. Uh, with with reasonable reimbursement um, since 2013, and with the new power knee, the margin is 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 suitable. Uh, it's not just suitable; it's it's very decent. Uh, and and there are private insurances, of course, paying for power knee as well. Uh, and then there there is a rec oh, excuse me a reimbursement guide that we have online uh, that can help you through uh, some of the paperwork and some of the codes and those types of things. So reach out to your your salesperson, whether you're in the U.S. or even globally, we have resources for you as well. And then I see the next question has to do with uh, hip disarticulations. Um, do we have any experience with that? Yes. Uh, we, we have used power knee with hip disarticulation level fittings and, and it works very well with that. Uh, and the recommended hip, uh, the helix hip from Autobach is, is the one that we've most commonly used. It works very well in combination with a power knee. Uh, it is absolutely possible to get good results with uh, the, uh, I think it's the 77 knee as well. Uh, I think I, only one of the time have I had a knee uh, separate from those two that I just mentioned. Great. Uh, that's uh, Jan, that's, thank that's you. about it. Yeah. No more Great. open questions here, Kurt. Thank you, Jan, for, for stepping in and asking the questions. That very much helps us all out. Uh, and we'll wrap up here. Uh, as we wrap up, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for your time. I know we've taken a few extra minutes of your day. Uh, and thank you for your, your interest in Powerney in, in understanding how to rehab, how to do, how to get better function on Powerney uh, with um, uh, with, with your, your patients, your amputees. And uh, we look forward to uh, changing expectations about what we, what we see in a prosthesis and the value that we believe power can bring. So thank you for joining us on the journey so far, but we look forward to, to you all joining us on this journey into kind of a new era of prosthetics where, where I think we can change some expectations here. For today, we thank you, uh, a quick thank you to a few people, Ian Fothergill uh, from Med Center O&P for hosting our video session where we got all these film, uh, this film today, for Jason for setting up the film shoot and, and doing some of the editing, 
uh, for Paul and being our star. And thank you, Paul, very much for your feedback and, and giving us uh, real live personal feedback about your experiences on uh, Parani. Very, very helpful. We appreciate that. And to Allison, who I think might be on this call as well, thank you for your uh, just just tireless help in, in uh, pushing Paul around a little bit and giving him uh, some rehab tips. Finally, uh, I want to thank you uh, to Dr. Gailey. Bob, uh, you're exemplary in giving us, uh, giving us the full gamut in how to understand rehabilitation when it comes to prosthetics. Your enthusiasm is unmatched, and, and I thank you for... Uh, for being a part of with you on these webinars. So thank you for your expertise for all of us. You're welcome. Thanks, Kurt. And as we move forward here, if you have any interest in Powerney, you can certainly scan this QR code, contact us or Bob's website if you want more information on any front here. Uh, but if you're interested in Powerney specifically, scan this QR code and it will lead you to a site where we will keep you informed about the upcoming uh, launch of Powerney in all global regions, uh, which will all be sometime in Q1 of next year in the first three months of next year. And with that, uh, well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Join us on this journey where we're going to change expectations and offer up lives without limitations.